everyone. Uh, good morning. Morning, I think. Um, I'm Will, and this is Kai, and um, we're going to talk firstly about the uh, uh, camp, which many of you will have been to. Um, we had some feedback, and basically a lot of people complained that we didn't give a presentation about what we did at the camp for the network, so we thought we'd do that here, and we'll also do a quick presentation about the, the network you've all been using here uh, these, these few days. So, uh, moving on to the first slide, um, quick review of what we're going to talk about um, on the uh, about the CAM network, um, the uplink, the hardware build up, um, and some of the monitoring and, and, and uh, the, th the stuff we use to run the wireless LAN. So uh, firstly, the uplink to the CAM site is, is quite a challenging, uh, it's quite challenging to get that kind of connectivity that, that everyone uses out into a, into a field in the middle of nowhere. Um, we, uh, we ended up with uh, two times one giggy uplinks to, to the campsite. Um, uh, one one giggy to, to Telta, a local telco, and um, a one giggy back to Berlin, uh, where we picked up various networks here in Berlin. Uh, the fibre was four kilometres through the woods. Um, we were pretty lucky because after all that, there was only like 20 metres of fibre left on the end of the spool. Um, <laughs> And uh, we didn't really fancy picking up and moving the data center container the sort of, uh, to make it reach. Um, we, we used a uh, peak around, what, 1.2 gig, something yep. like that, um, which is, which is lower than, lower than uh, Congress, but um, we obviously had less available. So what hardware did we use? Well, we had um, a Juniper MX80 as a BGP router. Uh, we speak BGP with all our upstreams. Um, we had some Force Tens as core routers and uh, in the, the Hack Center Colo, which uh, is always a busy place. And we actually, uh, for, for camp, we had the opportunity to buy uh, a lot of HP access switches, um, which, which was quite nice. Um, so uh, there's, there's a sort of big pile you can see on, on the, on the, on the uh, right there. Um, and we also had use of uh, 12 Hirschman, which are industrial Ethernet switches, which we used. Um, in, in, a, in a ring configuration around the site. This is the first uh, draft of the build-up. Um, kind of a nice little sketch. Um, Trying to work out where to run fibers. Do you want to talk about that? Bit? Yeah. Um, this was the first draft we brought the CCB when the whole campsite was fixed and most of the things were placed. Um, yeah, this is um, one of the end. We have uh, running a single mode 10 gig link around here, which was a ring. We run on the link hyperring protocol, which is a hyperring um, redundancy protocol of Hirschmann. They run uh, beacons uh, every 10 milliseconds, and if one side fails, one link, then it swaps the whole ring to the other side. Um, here we have a 10G spoke, and we ran single mode fibers here. Most of the fibers on the campsite were multi-mode, except the whole ring around the F area. Um, yeah, these are the blue things are all the data data flows, and yeah, we have three cable bridges up here, and we changed some, we rerouted stuff because here they want 10 gig, so we laid an extra fiber around the angel area to our data center. Yeah, me splicing. Uh, <laughs> we did around 120 uh, fusion splices because we uh, just we bought the fiber on a cable and we laid them in the ground, cut them, and then we have to make um, pigtails on it to plug it into switches. One one of the problems is that um, it's obviously quite a, a difficult environment to install fiber in. You can't buy ca easily buy c cable with connectors that will hand handle the sort of stresses of installing everything in, in the ground. Um, so yeah, the, the splicing is quite a kind of laborious task, really. Um, yeah, so it's nice like, to have a seat. <laughs> yeah, it was like uh, two days from getting up to sleep, done with splicing. <laughs> really boring and yeah. <laughs> we had around three kilometers of fiber to dig around the campground and it has to be like 20 centimeters deep. Uh, that no one pulls his, uh, puts his tent packs into it, and we have no cable breaks. So um, we build a plow. <laughs> On the left, you see the first version, which broke several times, we fixed it several times, and after all, we put it in the front of the radlader. 
and yeah, with a um, with a chain and some um, straps and everything. So this works in very good, and we can drive with like two or three kilometers per hour through the campground and dig a really deep, uh, yeah, ditch. Yeah. Um, to the wireless deployment, we run a Cisco VLC 5508 as wireless controller, and we have around yeah six. Yeah, Can you do 50, sums? <laughs> not really. <laughs> uh, we have around 50 APs deployed, so we had a wireless coverage over most of the whole site. Uh, there are some holes in between in the angel area and the workshop hangar because we don't map the hangars with the walls correctly into the map, which is a bit difficult. Yeah, we had to. Um, we had a big challenge. The access points have to be protected against rain and UV. And it has to be two or three meters high to get uh, with us a uh, race over all the caravans. So we fixed something with like some tubes and buckets and a lot of cable ties. Here's a series of tubes. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, this was how it looks. And uh, the access point is then just, uh, there's a... Um, a 90 degree stuff in there, and we you can just mount the access point with cable ties horizontal. It's, it's because they're designed for installing like in, in a building like this on on the on the ceiling. Um, but when you're at the camp, you don't have a ceiling, um, <laughs> so uh, so we kind of had to make our own. Yeah, this was our data center. It was a bit of a fuck up. Um, I talked with the guys, and it was a company which deploys normally data centers in a container with raised floor, air conditioning, power supplies, and everything. And it was a big thing of miscommunication, and so we got an empty shipping container with two retail racks and two air conditionings like you have at home with split devices. So, um, yeah, this is our data center rack with all our NOC stuff. There we have the E600. On the top, the, yeah, we had to fix some uplink splices. Uh, then we have the MX80 as BGP router, the Hirschmann as hyperring middle node, then some servers and the wireless controller and uh, UPS on the bottom. Um, yeah, this is a short movie. We built a weather map, and there you can see how the network expands, and you see the nice traffic flow. We'll, we'll put Which, this online somewhere if anyone's interested. Yeah, it's, it's quite available in the Pentabuff, and it will get bigger in a few seconds. <laughs> because we were editing this video on the fly as we as we built the network up, we added a new box, we we changed the weather map, and kept on kept on adding things. So um, this video it basically covers the whole timeline of us building up the camp, all the visitors arriving, and then basically to the final day. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> start moving some things around. <laughs> Um, basically, up up to the top here uh, is is the uplink connections. Um, yeah, and we uh, moved and the, the two routers up there are normally placed in the hack center in the data center, but then mm -hmm. there were no place no left place on, on the, the diagram, map. Yeah. And you can see the kind of the uplink one; it gets gets kind of busy towards the uh, <laughs> towards the end of the the camp. Yeah, and there you see the the, the links here switched. There we did a test if the hyperring protocol works, just unplugged one fiber and it's 10 milliseconds nice. later it was on the other side. There's some nice congestion down here. These, these people down in, down in this area of the field were obviously downloading quite a lot and uploading quite a lot. Um, this is just a single one giggy link. So um, we, did, we did manage to, there's only so many things you can do like installing new fibers and things like that. We do, do sort of re-engineer the network while it's in flight. Um, but uh, um, to, to kind of upgrade where required, but it's not always possible. Yeah, and this was the state at the end of the camp. Yeah. Um, we had a few problems on the side. We had Pinky and Brain, our main boxes for DNS, DHCP, and such things. Um, they had a hard disk failure, both boxes. Uh, we think it was on the transport or something. Mm. So, um, yeah, we lost one time the whole lease file, which was not so nice. And um, we had a big thing with the uh, Cut5 cables. They have a shield on both sides, and on the campgrounds there are several ground potentials with a big difference. So when you, uh, when you lay a cable from the outside of the angel area inside the, the bunker, 
you have a big uh, difference. So yeah, we have to disconnect the shield at one side because there are just too much power on it. Yeah, you might feel a little tingle actually when you're plugging in the cable and that's kind of uh, an indicator that something might be a bit wrong. <laughs> yeah, this is our uh, data, data close for the next event. <laughs> yeah, I think we might need to get the access points a bit higher, so we'll just have some thought about that. So this was the camp stuff. That's, that's the end of that. We'll, we'll just move on to the review of this. And this now of the current network of the Congress. We will just go over the topics uplink, core distribution, access wireless, colo, monitoring, some abuse and VPN and some rules at least. Um, at the uplink we had this time 2 times 10 gig over CVDM system. We got uh, 2 times 10 gig transit in the data center in Tempelhof from KPN and Hurricane Electric. And there we also patched uh, 3 1 gig E transit from Euro Transit, Carrier 51 and uh, peering with our permanent CCCAS. Also, we, have a, we are in the peering line at Berlin. There we can, yeah, we dropped off around 500 Mac traffic to Cable, Cable Deutschland there. We used a Brocade MLX4 SBGP router, which uh, placed in the data center, and then had a leg to the BCC. You want to start? So yeah, yeah. Um, we, we had quite a collection of uh, equipment this time around. Um, we, uh, coming in from, from the network, we had an MX80 uh, with uh, 20 gig going out each direction, basically in, into the uh, out out to the out to the internet, as it were, and into the middle of the network. Um, Force 10 E600, so similar similar to Camp, um, and we had some Cisco 6509s. Um, now one at one as one routing and uh, one one uh, as a as a switch um, for our kind of requirement for lots of one gig E copper ports. Um, we also had some 2960s's, which are like small Cisco 1U switches, uh, one gig uh, uh, as a stack in, in, in B90. Yeah, and C57, was, which is the biggest patch room in the house, we have around 200 patches to do there. Mm -hmm. The whole C and the big part of the B ring arrives there. Um, yeah, the 6509 was a bit difficult this year. At first, we have had the wrong fan blades. Since someone would ship the right fan blades, but it was the wrong fan blades again. Then we got the right fan blades, but then the power supplies were not enough. <laughs> so we have to get like on the 22nd uh, two power supplies Sit in Berlin, which was quite difficult, but yeah, it worked. Cisco have been shipping these chassis for like 15 years or something and, and it's one of those things where you have this broom and you've replaced the head like 10 times and the handle 10 times and yeah it's still the original chassis but all, all of the individual parts need, need replacing in it so um, because we had kind of had the old fan tray it's like yeah the newer line cards and need more draw more power and need more cooling and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah there's a network map of the current network and the left you see our uplinks we run all BGP, we speak all BGP with our uplinks. Uh, at the MLX and the Alwin counter, we terminate everything, and on the inside, we choose to only run OSPF because yeah. we don't need full tables. Last year, we had a ring between, we had an uh, additional link to, between A87 and A85, really? but the fire was too broken, and we are, we are too lazy to debug it again, and <laughs> it's like, Every year we debug it and it runs for several minutes and then CRC errors. Um, yeah, you see the router na um, behind A85. We had two colo switches which were connected with 10 gig Ethernet to A85 and distribute 1 gig Ethernet ports down. And the VLC, the wireless controller, was an 8, pro 8 gig lag. Uh, these are some upswing stats. Um, Everyone loves graphs. Yeah. <laughs> we had around 23 gigabit uplink. We only used five. So use more bandwidth. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, no, top five. We uh, with the top ASN we make traffic to. We was uh, uh, at all we were heavy outbound. We we're like five gig outbound and one gig inbound only. Most traffic goes to Daytag and Hetzner and also to some smaller access providers or bigger and yeah, the only content provider was Hetzner, the rest was only leeching from us and yeah, was outbound traffic. 
Oh, yeah. Know. So talking a bit about the wireless LAN, yeah. Again, this is quite similar to what we did at the camp. This, this Cisco lightweight controller solution has been working really well for us. Um, I think this is, what, the fourth time we've used it? Mm, third time? Third, third time, third, yeah. I think. yeah. Um, uh, we, we, uh, um, this basically, because it's more central control um, of, of how clients roam and, and things like that, it is it, it, really made a good st a step change in the quality of the wireless LAN we can provide. So again, it's much the same, um, just a smaller number of APs here, here in, in this occasion um, than, than at the camp because it's a smaller building. Um, we did, did find some bugs. Um, we, we had to put a V4, IPv4 ACL inside the uh, controller and um, that actually broke IPv6. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of IPv6 use now. The, the usage on the network is something like 7%. Um, which was quite surprisingly high and is really kind of heartening for, for those of us that are trying to get IPv6 deployed. Um. <laughs> so, so, so maybe we should maybe we should just start saying use more IPv6 bandwidth rather than <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And 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 I guess like the fact that people are reporting like they're leeching stuff at 30 megabits a second and, and video chatting and so forth and the wireless means that's that's kind of a good indicator that. It's working quite well for a lot of people. It's quite a challenging environment with the density of devices. But yeah, uh, if, yeah, here are some stats. Oh yeah, yeah. We had around 1,350 simultaneous users as average, and um, with around 19 users per access point. Our biggest access point, I think, was in the hack center with 140 clients. <laughs> we detected 3,300 unique wireless users. And so that's more than one device per person, just for uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, sp I suppose when I think about it, I'm probably carrying like four wireless LAN devices, and, 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 and many of you will be as well, so um, it's not so surprising. Yeah, then you see the client distribution, so the most people are using 11.n in the 2.4 gigahertz band, but the most traffic runs over 11.n in 5 gigahertz band. Yeah, like it was the half of all the traffic. I think that shows how much better the five gigahertz band is, um, and uh, it's something when you think about when you're buying new hardware, is you really want to look for that five gigahertz um, capability because you just have more more oomph there, more more, yeah, and, more stuff available. <laughs> <laughs> and we turned off 11b again, like at the camp, because it's yeah. only slowing down, and 2.4 gigahertz is so crowded. Yeah, there's some statistics like some traffic peaks around the afternoon, the evening, and yeah, the client counts. It's, it's quite, quite good because when people get finish using their Wi-Fi devices, go to sleep, you can really like see when people, people, have, people have, uh, have left the Congress, um, when, when, the, when, the, uh, the ac when the devices are no longer associated, far more so than you say we see with traffic. Um, yeah, the co-location, I just mentioned it, you have two switches, two times 10 gig each. Uh, it was smaller, uh, smaller the last, than last year, but um, the cases, they are really crap. One time I had to carry out a server because of abuse, which was a box with a switch, two plugs, and tons of cables, which is not nice to carry, or some things like this, uh, the smallest hit on the case, will make that the uh, hard disks crash. So get better cases. Yeah, this was our um, motto for this year. We want to monitor as much as we can out of the network. So we built our dashboard. I saw this at DreamHack, and I want this for the Congress too. So we started with bandwidth. The clients connected the POC and the streaming clients. Then we added a radiation level, and then the wireless bandwidth usage, how many open beacon rockets are in the network, and IP protocol distri distribution. Um, next year, we will run all this stuff from the beginning, and so the graphs are bigger and fancier. And if you've got any I other ideas of what we can monitor easily, then we could add that. Yep. I mean, I, d I don't think we have some kind of martyr consumption sensor, but that could be <laughs> useful. Uh. <laughs> Um, this was a metal weather map of the current network. You have on the left the uplinks, then the BGP router, and then the intro network on the right. It was we had a 10, uh, 20 gig connection between most of the switches. Yeah, so all, all this is uh, 20 gig, t two times uh, 10 gig 
10 gig set of links there. Um, and, and I think we, we kind of needed it with, with the peak utilization yeah, there. We don't have much congestion and yeah, we had about 8 or 9 gig between the hex center and the core router upstairs. Um, yeah, this is our Isinga map. We use Isinga for monitoring. Isinga is a Nagios fork. We had around 200 hosts monitored with around 1,100 services. We monitored all the equipment like servers, routers, all the access switches and the access points. And additionally, the environment that uh, we unplugged some switches, uh, some fans at some switches that they don't get too hot or the uplinks are that they are on always some stuff left. And we have a quite annoying IRC board for alarms which are just talking every time, hey, an uplink port is full, or here are some uh, too much max and such things. We used also AS stats with a, with a small Perl packet for S-flow analysis on AS base. We used MRTG for all the graphs, and we used ring.nlnoc.net, which is a project where you share servers with some other uh, ISPs, so you can debug the network or some uplinks doing trace routes. So, so this, um, this, this big graph here, this nice pretty colors and everything, is, uh, um, this is actually the, uh, destinate, the network tra traffic to and from individual networks, and this is based on our KPN uplinks, so we were sending quite a lot of traffic to DTAG, that's, that's all this stuff here in, in, the, in the red. Um, but this is really useful for us when we need to do some traffic engineering, we need to balance where we're sending traffic. Um, yeah, it was quite easy this year because we had around 20 ASNs which have a huge load of traffic like between 100 and 600 Mbit and it was really easy to shift the traffic to another uplink because just you yeah. shift it and 200 Mbit are away from one uplink. Yeah, it's a really useful, useful tool this um, and really good for us to know where, where we're sending traffic. Um, we had some abuse. Uh, two things, there uh, was an online shop who was dosed via an exit node via the PRP zero day of Alech and a news portal. Um, yesterday night at 6 we had a DOS against our DNS and DHCP server from the Amazon EC2 cloud. And all of you DOS events CCD, <laughs> which was a quite weak setup with an Apache 2 and nothing more. And now it's a Varnish and Nginx and Memcached. So it should take the next Congress better. <laughs> um, we ran a VPN with around 20 beacons of the Congress, which are hacker spaces who want to participate here. They did a peak traffic of around 150 megabit. We also had a DN42 and case VPN peering. Um, yeah, we have some rules for you for the next time. If you have a switch on your table, don't unplug it. We monitor the switch for everything, and we have a tagged VLAN on the first port, so when you change the uplink port, the switch won't respond for us. If it's too loud, or you want to replace it with a switch of your own with more gigabit ports, or you need a quiet thing, just talk to us, because if it's too loud, we can just unplug the fans. They are robust and not very warm. And when you want to replace it, we just remove from our monitoring. And all the wall sockets are usable, most at one gigabit ports. And down in A, it's the only floor where you have only patched every second port because we don't have enough patch port on the Cisco there. Yeah, some questions. This was a nice, nice uh <laughs> This, this photo was actually from the camp, um, yeah. but someone, someone left us a nice message, so thanks for that. Um, it's, it's nice when you're kind of walking through all this mud and getting yourself filthy, clearing up, and find a nice message from someone, so thanks. <laughs> well, thanks to you to keep our central nervous system running here, our network. Uh, do you have any questions? Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to come to your place. Any questions? Sorry, standing in front of the loudspeaker. And do we have questions from the internet yet? No questions? How about back of the room? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Yes. Microphone is on its way. Hey, um, I have a question to the camp. 
Is the fiber still laying on the gram count? No. Uh, the ground? No. We collect them all, put them on spinals, and put them in the storage. The uplink too? Uh, no, the uplink was going back to the uh, provider, and they are digging them anywhere in the cities there. We, we actually reuse some of the fibers, so some of the, the fibers we use, there's a kind of big pool of them, and uh, some of them are as old as How 2001, if any one of you were there, um, and um, uh, they kind of get used every, every couple of years or, or when sort of required, so we don't, we don't throw this stuff away. Um, if it can be reused, then, then we will reuse it. Okay, and then we have a question from the back of the room. We need a microphone to get to this place. In the meantime, let, just let me announce you for the English speaking of you. We have a translation of the talk, Security Nightmares, on deck 8004 later. So it's a talk in German, but if you want to listen to it in English, there will be a, in English there will be a live translation. Now here's the question. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your work. And um, I would like to ask if you have any documentation for your monitoring stuff. Um, um, um. Because I want to use it on my own network. <laughs> yeah, we have some uh, some wiki for knock internal stuff with the scripts, and we are thinking about doing a small public page with all the knock talks and scripts we use. This is so. it's quite an interesting question, actually, because this year after camp, we realized that we sort of reinvent the wheel every time. So. Um, um, yeah, it could be useful for two If you have any special all of us. things, just mail us you want to have, and yeah, I yeah. think we can get you everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another question from up here. Yeah, also, thank you for your work very much. How many people are working in the NOC team? Uh, we were not so much this year, but we were around 10, 15 people who were there at the Congress. And when did you start setting up the network? Um, in the BCC, we start on the 23rd. I deployed the uplink router on the 18th December or something. And the first patch for the first KPN 10 gig link was around October in the co-location. Okay. So Christmas was a little hurt. Yep. <laughs> well, any more questions? Yes, uh, over there. Thanks for getting it. Right over there. Have you considered adding encryption to the wireless? Mm, no, not really. You can use a VPN or something, it's just too much load and yeah, everyone can encrypt the servers at its own and yeah. <laughs> okay, there's one more question, yes? Um, is there any interest um, from the companies manufacturing the equipment, uh, say Cisco, HP, um, in how well their equipment performs? Do mm. they have, are they mm. interested in it? Not really, it was quite difficult to get some hardware this year because the process are you have to find someone who will like to sponsor for Brocade, I proxied with a company for this event because the management there won't sponsor the CC officially. And so it was for other companies which I just want to stay unnamed. And was more or less from all from carrier pools or something and not directly from the vendors. We, we, we have in the past, we've had a lot more sort of relationship, generally with, with individual people in vendors that are actually come here and, and, and are interested in what happens here. And, um, and, and that can be really valuable when you have someone on the inside as well. Um, but they come and go, right? It's not an official activity, but it's nice. Okay. Up front here. Hello. Uh, to answer the question about uh, wireless and encryption, um, there's actually not much we can do about that to provide you with encryption on the wireless because uh, even if you put a pre-shared key, on the wireless and give it to every uh, Congress uh, participant. Uh, everyone who has this private key and witnesses and captures the package of your first association can decrypt uh, your session keys because they are derived from your pre-shared key. So um, we would have to set up. Uh, well, we would have to set up an account 
on a radio server. <laughs> so, and everyone would have to use that account to associate to the encrypted network. Um, but this is a lot of, uh, this provides a lot of work for uh, people and for the help desk because um, uh, some wireless clients do handle handover between, uh, between wireless stations in encrypted networks quite poorly, especially if there are many uh, networks and substations available like at the Congress. So um, if you are concerned about your privacy on the wireless network, which you should be, uh, we can only recommend you to use a VPN service. Okay, last two questions. Thank you. So, uh, at DEF CON, they have this thing called the wall of sheep, where they monitor all the traffic, and the wireless traffic, and then they print all the passwords and usernames that are sent plain text over the network on a big wall of monitors. And uh, have you thought about bringing something like this to the Congress? We don't monitor your traffic. We don't look in the contents of your, your stuff. Uh, <laughs> We, 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 we kind of take this, this sort of privacy stuff quite seriously, I think. Um, yeah, last year we had a privacy officer who checked all our cells that we don't lock too much and we are just giving a high level of privacy everywhere. Like we have encryption on every server which has user data yeah. and the first one, so we have no backup server for DHCP at the moment because the first one is already wiping. And yeah, we don't want your user data because it will that will make problems at any time. Some, sometimes we have to record or temporarily store user data for the operation network. I mean, a good example is a DHCP leases file that contains your MAC address, your IP address, stuff like that. Um, and we have, to, we have to put that on a disk, right? Um, but um, we, we, we're quite careful to wipe that at the end of the Congress. And we really, I, I don't think it's, it's I think we're, we feel strongly that it's not our, our job to be looking at, at the contents of people's packets. What's the usual legal fallout? Will someone be getting a bucket full of lawyer mail after each event? Mm, no, we just get only a bucket full of um, yeah, automated stuff like Sony says we, stop to we should stop torrenting stuff. <laughs> I still get things from the Congress network which were torrented yesterday and this is the IP range we gave them back one year ago. And yeah. we got, so we get lots of stuff from the automated things like IDS and something from Head Snow where you say, oh, you're doing FTP and that's bad. <laughs> so, so actually the address block we get is a, is a temporary address block and it changes each time and it's actually then assigned to someone else. So it's pretty likely that we keep on getting the abuse mails, but it's actually not our abuse at all. It's like whoever owns the net block now. So. Um, these, they're really, really poor at keeping like their who is data updated, and and it's, there's no excuse for it, right? But unfortunately, maybe just a short comment. Uh, if you log into Gmail account and look at the last activity of your account, you see all the logins from the IP address pool from here, and it's associated with Russia. Yeah. And a friend of mine was very confused. Oh, I, my account was hacked from Russia, but it was himself. <laughs> yeah, on camp we had the same problem. I think the net block was located in Denmark. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it it's, just it's, takes a few months to it's located in Berlin and with temporary blocks it's difficult to get a correct de geolocation into in a few days. Yeah, yeah, because of the, the short time frame. And again, when you go to the main google.com site you get some Russian characters. Oh, well, <laughs> keeps life interesting. <laughs> All right, well, I think I'll wrap things up. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for keeping the network running.